you remember, when we started the course, we started with particle motion and broke it into two parts. And we're going to do the very same thing with the rigid body motion that we've uh, begun now. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because we're going to make the, the first transition here just like we did in the particle uh, so we looked at particle kinematics first. We looked solely at the acceleration, the velocity, the position, and of course the time that went with it. But treating everything as a particle. Now that we're treating everything as a rigid body, we're again <coughs> started with the kinematics. But that's what we just finished. Uh, and if you noticed, I, I think we did that whole business in in three days, and I think the particle kinematics was, was about three weeks because it's all, it's, it's so very much similar. Remember, it's a, as much as anything, it's, it's you just swap out the variables and you've got the same concepts that uh, we did with particle kinematics and translation that we do uh, in rotation. We needed to take the greater step in here in looking at general motion. So we had to put the translation and the rotation together. But that was still all just kinematics. Then we went to the kinetics. Remember the difference? What was the kinetics? I don't want to force you. Is that when you apply energy and momentum? Well, yeah. That's, well, what we were doing here is finally figuring out how do we make sure we get the kinematics we want. A lot of what we did in the kinematics was acceleration. The kinetics is how do we get that acceleration. So we started with uh, F equals MA as uh, one way to solve kinetics problems. Then we used the work energy method and then we looked at impulse momentum. We're going to do very much the same pattern, only, again, in uh, uh, a more rapid fashion because so much of what we're doing we've already learned. Uh, but we're going to be doing the kinetics starting today, and we'll be doing the uh, uh, Newton's laws, force balance. Remember, these are not all mutually exclusive of each other. They're just different ways of looking at very much uh, a lot of the same stuff. Uh, and it just these have to lay themselves out as different ways to solve different problems in a little bit more efficient way. And we're going to find the same thing is true as we get over here at rigid body motion. So we'll look now at rigid body kinetics. So there's a rigid body of ours. We'll uh, uh, break it into the, the different possible ways we can approach this. So we've got some rigid body subject to all kinds of possible forces. Any direction, any place. Any magnitude, and I could, I could, uh, however many there are. You know, naturally, in most of our problems, we'll be down to a little bit fewer than these, uh, and or they'll be in more regular directions. But for the most part, uh, we want to keep this very general. Might also have a concern with the weight of the object. It's not always a concern in problems. But it often is, and so we uh, tend to use that as a single force at the center of gravity rather than a distributed force throughout the object, as it really is, because each molecule that makes it up is a force of a, uh, has its own weight. And we know uh, in pure translation, Translation. In pure translation, a rigid body will act such that the sum of the forces in whichever direction will cause the center of gravity itself 
to accelerate in that direction. And the sum of the forces in the y direction will cause the center of gravity to possibly have a y component of that acceleration. All we're saying there is if we've got some forces on there and it's unbalanced, then the center of gravity will accelerate and that will be our description for the subsequent motion of the object uh, due to these unbalanced forces. And there will be uh, y, uh, x and y components to that. We can find out the x and y components in the uh, summation of the forces in those particular directions. If it is in pure translation, though, it's got to be true then that uh, the moment, the moment summed on the object will themselves re result, uh, will sum to zero. Otherwise, it would have some angular acceleration. Uh, if you remember from physics one, I guess we can be a little more complete. We can put in that the moment of inertia of the object times its angular acceleration. But if it's in pure translation, that is zero. And uh, so if the moments are in balance, it's in pure translation. If it's in pure translation, then the moments balance. Those two things are, are uh, essentially one and the same. These are collectively known as the equations of motion. They're the equations that describe what the subsequent motion or lack thereof. You could have a static situation. Uh, these are, uh, these equations uh, determine all that we're going to need to know about the object. And so our, our purpose in the next couple days as we uh, finish out the semester is to apply those equations of motion as appropriate. So that's what we need for translational motion. For rotational motion, again, we've got the possibility of any kinds of forces any number of forces acting on this object. But in this case, in the, in the possible case of uh, pure rotation, then the forces must sum to zero in both directions so that there's no subsequent acceleration and we'll have only some kind of rotational motion about the center of gravity. Uh, if it's not about the center of gravity, we'll, uh, we'll deal with that possible case in, other, uh, in another way in a second. But the equations of motion are such that the x and the y result in no acceleration, and if we sum the moments about g, we can determine what that angular rotation, uh, rotational acceleration is that we might have in these problems. So that then becomes the equations of motion. Just because any of them happen to be zero, doesn't mean they're not of use to us. They most certainly will be as we go through this. And then, of course, we'll very quickly get to the case of general motion. We'll, uh, we'll spend the day looking at translation of rigid bodies, then we'll look at rotation of rigid bodies, and then the general motion of rigid bodies. Um, this has with it other possibilities for, at least for the analysis of these, that can make some of the problems uh, 
somewhat easy. They're not necessarily significantly easier. But in this case, we have a situation such that the forces result in some acceleration of the body in a translational fashion. But there are also the possibility of unbalanced moments that will leave us with some acceleration, angular acceleration. And the equations of motion are the full, at least for our purposes, the full uh, three uh, non-zero equations now that will give us general motion. Uh, hopefully you recognize that these are all 2D problems, which is why we only have three equations of motion. If they were full 3D equations, we could have as many as six equations of motion, three in each of the coordinate directions for uh, the two uh, the forces and the general uh, rotation causing moments. We do have one other possibility, and I'll show you how it applies today. It's a, uh, just another possible way for us to need to look at this uh, business of general motion like we've got here. We could, we could have the possibility that two or more of the forces happen to intersect at a certain point well, the two, of the two of the forces almost always intersect unless they're parallel. But we could have the case that two forces happen to intersect at a particular point, maybe one of great interest in the problem, as we'll see uh, when we apply this in a little bit. And there could be other forces in the problem. But we can use that to our advantage in some cases to actually make the problems a little bit easier. Uh, once we sum all the forces and we know that there's some acceleration of the object itself, we can actually sum the moments about a different point by using uh, the parallel axis theorem on the uh, moment of inertia. And so the equations of motion for us then can be somewhat uh, expanded for our purposes. However, um, you're going to have to be careful as you go to apply this. So we can sum the moments about this point P. That means that the, the two forces I've drawn there, F1 and F2, don't happen to exert any moment, and that's how the problem can become simpler. But when we do that, we need to understand that then we need to know the moment of inertia of, with respect to that point P, not the moment of inertia with respect to its own center of gravity, which is usually the one we have uh, at our disposal in the first place. However, we can relate the two, and you can do exactly this with uh, the um, parallel axis theorem. And so, depending upon which one of the uh, two moments of inertia that we have, it could be that we have IP it could be that we have IG instead, or it could be that uh, we're just things become so much simpler if we do this about point P. And I'll show you a case of exactly that. Uh, actually, we'll look at a couple cases of it. Uh, it can be tricky. I don't think it's any coincidence that this second form has MAD on it, because if you screw this up, and it's fairly easy to do, you'll become quite mad. And you'll try to express that anger in my direction, and I'll just uh, uh, callously deflect it. Because that's what I do. 
All right, so let's see how this works. We'll do, we'll do one problem um, in this general uh, motion form, uh, and then we'll do another one in this general form of motion. Well, actually, we're not doing a general motion problem. We're doing a, we'll do a translational motion problems only. But these two, uh, these two different approaches do come in. Um, because for translation, we want the angular acceleration to be zero. So we need to apply that equation uh, as need be. Oh, wait. First, let me lay out a little bit of the procedure of how to go through these things. Just to, just to help lay it out a little bit. As you can imagine, one of the most important things to us is going to be an accurate and useful free body diagram. By accurate, I mean you've got to have all the pertinent forces. You can't have just some of them. You need to have all of them. Uh, you also, though, don't want forces that don't matter in there unless you can make it clear that they don't matter uh, with, uh, with that drawing. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, there's sometimes where the uh, the weight hasn't mattered because we weren't doing any movement in that direction. Uh, we'll find this time now, though, that uh, most of this will apply. Um, you'll need to identify the unknowns, not just the ones asked for, but all of the ones in the free body diagram or uh, other parts of the problem that are unknown uh, so that you can get the right number of equations. Those equations to start with are the equations of motion. The very ones I just wrote down, the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments. In uh, translation, the uh, some of the forces general in the x-direction won't be zero, in the y-direction they will be, and the sum of the moments about g generally will also be zero, because uh, if we're looking at pure translation, we don't want an angular acceleration in the problem. Obviously, you've got to get the same number of those. You need the same number of equations that you have uh, unknowns, we only have, for our 2D problems, three equations of motion. There might be more than that unknown in the problem, and in that case, you need to bring in the kinematics. That will supply you with more uh, equations. Uh, for rotational motion problems, it could be uh, those uh, arc length type pro uh, equations, V equals R omega, uh, alpha equals R, no, A equals R alpha. Uh, that might be all you need to, to apply. It could be the constant acceleration equations, uh, any of the ones that you might need to know, might need to apply to have enough equations to satisfy the number of unknowns that you got. This is your job as undergraduates. You've got to get the numbers here to match. Number of unknowns, number of equations have to match. Okay, so we'll do a problem here with uh, a darn fine looking sports car in the problem. Look at that, that's a beauty. Hey, not on you. Nothing more than a hot car. So, Jetsons? No, no. Alright, so there's a, there's a nice sports car. And we want to find out uh, what the acceleration will be because guys if you don't know it now Samantha will confirm it, if you want to attract a lady you've got to up the acceleration in your car it's the only way it works uh, if you can do that while peeling out all the better because she might be on the other side of the parking lot and she hears your tire squealing. She, it's like the mating call of the American male. Am I right? Look at her, she's back to you. 
So we're going to find the, the, the acceleration while peeling out. That's a, that, you guys know that phrase, don't you, peeling out? It's not just a phrase from uh, I think my 60s. I believe that's childhood. The tires are slipping against the uh, ground. Yeah, the tires will be slipping. So we need, we need to uh, look at kinetic friction in this yes. problem. The dynamic friction. Coefficient yes. of kinetic friction will take to be 0.25 there. And some of the other things we need. Uh, the center of gravity, now this is not something we've had to worry about before. We need to know where it is in relation to some of the other parts and pieces. So, uh, <coughs> it's a certain distance back from the front wheels and in front of the back wheels. These are uh, in meters. 1.25 meters and 0.75 meters. So the, the center of gravity is back a little bit. We're going to assume that this is a rear wheel drive car. Uh, typically they do put the center of gravity back farther towards the drive wheels just so the, the uh, normal force goes up and thus the friction goes up. And We'll also need to know that that center of gravity is uh, 0.3 meters above the road surface itself. On this, man, that's silly. We, we got rid of those and put in a multi track CD player with iPod. Uh, I don't know. Samantha, help us out here. What's the kind of stuff that you need to see in a guy's car? How about airbags? Cowboy boots. Cowboy boots, yeah. Gun rack. Gun rack. Gun rack in the back window there. Oh, I love it. The Corvette. That's not a Corvette. That's, that's a, that's it looks a, like a mid engine. Anyway, back to the problem, class. All right. So we need a free body diagram to start with. So very simple sketch of the car. Starts looking a little cartoonish in the free body diagrams. All right, obviously <coughs> it's got uh, weight. Oh, by the way, uh, 2,000 kilograms. So uh, it's got some weight, and we'll take it to act at that point G. Other forces, uh, well, there's must be normal forces due to contact with the ground. So we'll call those uh, N A at the front and B at the back. And if it's a rear-wheel drive car, then the motive force is actually the friction at the back wheel. <coughs> we'll assume that the front <coughs> wheels are light enough that there's no appreciable friction there. It's actually the friction with the roadway that applies the torque that makes the, the front wheels start spinning. But we'll assume that those wheels are so light that they'll just... Uh, uh, that their contribution to the problem is negligible. Also, if we have the mass, we're not going to consider the weight as an unknown. Let's just uh, take that as a given. Now, in some of these problems, it can be very helpful to use what's called a kinetic diagram. If you're careful, it can just be a part of the free body diagram. If you're not careful, it should be a separate diagram. But all that is, is a diagram, a drawing of the object with the expected resultant motion sketched in. So for our 
amazing car. It would be nothing more, in this case, than the acceleration drawn in. And when I say you need to be careful when you do this, you can put this on the free body diagram. It would look nothing more than <coughs> like that. What happens though if you're not careful? Some of you. You can take this to be a vector that needs to be added in with all the others if you're not careful. Uh, most of you might see that you need to do MA uh, for that to actually be a force. But that's not a force that we add into the force balance. That in itself is just simply the result of the force, forces being out of balance. So you can do either one of those. Uh, it works very nicely for me because I'm smart enough to do all my work in pink and blue and yellow chalk. But most of you don't do your work in chalk. So. Uh, be careful with the kinetic diagram. Alright, so we'll do this in two ways. We'll do this uh, using the uh, general motion equation in this way, and then we'll do it using the general motion equation in that way. And see uh, whether one or t'other would have been simpler. Alright, so sum the forces in the x direction. That's where we're going to get this acceleration we're looking for because we already anticipate that there'll be an x direction acceleration uh, that's well it's just what we knew anyway uh, that's the general motion of a car um, but we can confirm, we confirm that with our kinetic diagram so taking the uh, expected direction of acceleration is positive just to make things simpler what have we got uh, we've got F, B, and that's it, equals M, A, G. And I can leave off the X there because uh, we're anticipating no Y direction acceleration. The whole acceleration is in the X direction here. And we know that to equal U, K, N, B for this particular uh, uh, situation. That's where the friction is acting, is that back wheel. So we know that it will be the normal force times the coefficient of friction. So, um, two unknowns so far, AG and NB. So we don't want to increase that by too much if we can help it. So we'll sum the forces in the y direction, but we anticipate no um, y direction acceleration. Now, if the point of this acceleration was not only to peel out and make a lot of noise, but also to pop the front end in the air like a wheelie, then that would not be zero because we'd actually want the uh, center of gravity to rise as the car went into a, a wheelie. Uh, a sort of a desperate situation uh, for a guy to, to, to do that. If, if the original wheeling out didn't attract enough women, he might have to do the wheelie business. Um, motorcycle guys do it more. We'll get to them in a minute. All right. We'll take up as positive. So we have NA plus NB, so there's another unknown, NA is now in the equation, uh, minus W, oh, equals, equals W. We know that up force is equal to down forces since they sum to zero. If they didn't sum to zero, it's not worth doing that, but since they sum to zero, like we did in statics, it just makes things easier. So we have three unknowns now, AG, NB, and now NA is in it, so we need uh, at least one more equation. We need more than that if this equation brings into it a new unknown. So we'll sum the moments about G. 
we don't want any angular acceleration with respect to the center of gravity, so we know that's zero. And we'll take the, the well, since they sum to zero, we'll do clockwise moments equal uh, counterclockwise moments, so we won't have any minus signs. So about g, we have Na times 1.25. That's the moment arm for the normal force Na. That's a uh, clockwise torque about G. So is the friction force, which we're making uh, mu K N B. The friction we don't need to take as an unknown since it's uh, kind of like the mass and the weight. Uh, and its moment arm is, I want you to pick it out. This is with respect to G. It's what? <clears throat> Phil says point 0.3. Anybody agree with them or disagree with them? Remember what we're looking for about point G, the moment arm for FB, and that's the minimum distance between the two, which is the perpendicular distance, and that's the point 0.3 uh, in the diagram. The center of gravity is point 0.3 above the roadway. Very easy to mess these up. These have not been of terrible importance to us in previous problems because we were taking things as particles. And then NB is a moment in the opposite direction and its moment arm is the 0.75. So we didn't introduce any new unknowns we don't need another equation. These three should suffice. They are independent. There's three of them. We have three unknowns. So that's sufficient to solve the problem. And since it's not an algebra class, I'll just give you those. So. Solving that system of equations, we get an acceleration of 1.59 meters per second squared. Uh, fellas, you got to be over two to attract the girl, so this isn't going to be adequate. The car's uh, a nice looking car, I'll tell you, but it's just not going to do it. Of course, that's pretty low coefficient of friction, so maybe we shouldn't do this on gravel. Uh, Na is 688, 6.88, uh, that would be kilonewtons, pretty light car if it was newtons, and Nb, and this is just the algebraic solution of that system of equations, is 12.7. That's part of the reason for having the center of gravity more near the back of the car, more near the drive wheels. It does make NB bigger, which increases the force of friction, which increases the acceleration. Okay. Chris, those numbers work out? Frown. Slightly different or grossly different? 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.3, those numbers are okay. 2,000 kilograms, that's okay. All right. Well, uh, if anything, what's left is, is algebra, because I think all the physics is right. So check the algebra, but I'm pretty sure that's okay. Then I want to redo the problem from the beginning 
not summing the moments about G, but summing them about some other point. So, we'll start over again with the car. Same, uh, same basic setup. All the dimensions are the same. We've got W and A and B and this friction force FB. Now we're only asked to find the acceleration in this, so if we can get rid of some of these forces, maybe the solution will be a little bit easier. Notice that FB and NA both intersect right there. So if we sum the forces, sum the, sorry, sum the moments about that point, then uh, the problem might be a little bit easier. But, I warn you, you have to do it properly. Here's what happens, and it's, it's a, a very easy thing to do, and once I tell you not to do it, it's still going to be a little difficult to see why you can't do it. We do not want this to have any angular acceleration. The temptation is to say, then, that this is zero, but that's not the case. Because this, remember, equals... IG alpha plus MAGD. This, remember, comes from the parallel axis theorem applied to the moment of inertia. Just like before, IG alpha is zero. But notice this part is a remainder here, which shows that this alpha is not zero. Uh, at that instant, they do have a different angular acceleration about those different points. So don't say back here that this is zero. If you're going to use just the uh, sum of the moments equals I alpha, make sure that the subscripts match. A, A here, I had G, G here. If those subscripts don't match, A here and a G here, then you need to apply the parallel axis there and this entire quantity is not zero. So it's very, very easy to say alpha is zero back here, but you won't get the right results. That's what, got it. That's what you did over there? Thank you. Thank you for, for falling on your sword like that. We appreciate that. You, you, you must have a bad car, so you have to make up for it in some other brave way. That's not pink. That's not pink either. That's red. That's candy apple red. When I draw a car, my my pink mark, my pink chalk becomes candy apple red. With a little bit of metallic gold flake in. So, all right. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, one other thing that I think helps with this, but it's not absolutely required. That's to use the direction of positive as the same direction of the acceleration we're looking for with respect to the point we've selected. In this case, we've selected point A. Two forces intersect there. We're not concerned with just what the two forces are. We, uh, so it made sense to pick uh, point A. Notice that with respect to point A, the acceleration is counterclockwise with respect to point A. So that's the easiest way to pick the positive direction. But you don't need to. You can pick either way as the positive direction. It's just if you do it this way, there's fewer minus signs. And that generally makes solutions go a little bit better. All right, so sum the moments with respect to point A. NA doesn't apply. W is counterclockwise, so that's minus 1.25 meters W. And remember, W is not an unknown. We have the mass, so we have the weight. 
the minus because it's counterclockwise with respect to our point A when clockwise, uh, counterclockwise, sorry, is defined as the positive direction just because that's the way AG is going. Uh, so that's W, uh, F, the friction force goes right through A, which is why we picked point A. So we need uh, then to add on the moment due to D. Now, that's with respect to point A. So it's the full two meters back of the front wheel. Point A is our front wheel. So this is then two meters. And that equals IA alpha, but we don't have IA. So we need to go to this form where the moment of inertia doesn't matter. And that equals M, which we've got, AG, which we're looking for, and D, I'll just go ahead and write it in. Uh, D is the distance, the, uh, the minimum distance between AG and our point of interest, which is the point three. So, uh, one, two unknowns. So we will need another equation, but if we have another equation that only has those two in it, then we haven't introduced any unknowns and we have a little bit simpler situation. Uh, and notice our sum of the forces in the x direction has only those two unknowns. A and F don't come into it. And so that's uh, our best bet for uh, the second equation. And it's in simplest form, MAG equals mu K and B. That way we don't need to solve for NA. Not that it was a terribly big deal, but this is easier to solve. Uh, the, uh, this is a very simple two equation system. Uh, that was a little bit more complicated. Three are always more complicated. Well, I don't know if it's always, but my little brain is always. And there's only two unknowns, and that very simply goes into that one, and we get the same, same answer we would have gotten before. Watch this. If nothing else, everybody should realize that Chris did it, I can do it. Put the pressure on Chris. David, okay? I'm trying to understand why you don't want that. This, isn't that odd? But it's because of the uh, angular momentum of a of point G uh, with respect to point A. Um, if you want more detail on where that comes from, it's in the book in a brief discussion. Um, I don't think it's nearly as clear a discussion where it comes from as it is to use it if I give you the uh, appropriate caveat, which I believe I did. Okay, so uh, you can see where that came from in the book if you want. I don't think it's worth it for us to, uh, to develop that uh, in any extensive way uh, to, to derive that. Okay. So let's do another problem. I'll leave more of this one to you. Um, we have a, a motorcycle with rider. So we'll just sketch it in very simply. Remember, we don't need a big deal for the drawing here. So there's the motorcycle. Its center of gravity, we'll put right there, G1, and the rider's center of gravity we'll put up about there.
Now, we've got two choices in the problem. We can combine those two and find a combined center of gravity. As long as we know where those two are, we can combine them, get a single center of gravity for the entire vehicle. But it's just as easy to leave them separately and uh, apply the, the moments that they cause uh, and any forces they cause separately. And it all just comes out to be the same in the wash. So a couple of the uh, dimensions that we need. Again, with respect to the contact at the back tire and the front tire. So we have these three horizontal distances we're concerned with, just like we were in the other problem. This one's 0.4. This one is also 0.4. But that one's 0.7. And these are all meters. So nice big drawing. Gosh, you need a bigger motorcycle there, Joe. But who doesn't need a bigger motorcycle? That's what I always say. And then some of the vertical dimensions we need. We need to know the height of those two centers of gravity above the ground, as we saw we did in the other problem. Just because this is a uh, motorcycle instead of a car doesn't mean that uh, uh, the same ideas don't apply. So, the uh, rider center of gravity is 0.3 above the motorcycles, and the motorcycle center of gravity is 0.6 above the ground. So what are the two pieces? We need the mass. All right, so we have M1 and M2, where one is the bike, two is the rider. 125 and 75. Bike is 125 kilograms. The rider is 75 kilograms. David, you took technical free and sketching. You can do an awesome motorcycle, I bet. Not really. No. That, oh, Ken, you, you took it, so. You're, you're all excited about this. Yeah. All right, so there's a picture. I'll give you a, a couple seconds to, uh, to uh, put that together. I'm going to need another one, another sketch of it, because we are going to do a free body diagram. So just sketch it in. It's not any great shapes of what that looks like. We're just going to apply the, the forces uh, as we need to. And this one will address a, uh, a different method for uh, young men to try to attract young women in case the car didn't work, or in case you totaled the car earlier. But I don't see many red sports cars because teenagers wrap them around trees. All right, what we want to do is find the minimum kinetic, no, static. We're not going to spin the wheels on this one. I guess that wouldn't work. Think about it. We want the minimum static coefficient of friction so that the rider pops a wheel. And you just gotta love that phrase for all of the Americana that that uh, that lives in that one phrase. Pops a wheelie. I'm not. I'm, I'm reliving my childhood right now as we speak. We used to do it on a stingray bicycle. Uh, Ten bars of a banana seat with leopard skin by a friend. It wasn't retro then. I mean, that, was, that was the cutting edge. Um, let's also then find the acceleration of the bike uh, just to make sure it's going to register on, uh, on the, uh, the babe meter that all men have in their heads. You know, 
useful that is. Thanks for coming today. All right, everybody, everybody up to uh, up to speed here. Billy, all set. All right, free body diagram. We've got, uh, of course, the two weights: the weight of the rider and the weight of the bike. Don't consider those unknown. We've got the masses. We also know that there's a normal force at each. And there's a friction force on the rear wheel. Um, there's a, a few two-wheel drive motorcycles around, but I don't know that there's any front-wheel drive motorcycles around, so it's just a standard bike with rear-wheel drive. We want to find the minimum coefficient of static friction. If the static friction we have is too small, then the wheels will start spinning and the friction force is lower, the acceleration is less, and the car, the, the bike won't pop a wheelie. If the static friction is more than that, then it's sufficient for uh, finding a wheelie. It's just, uh, it's just uh, extra static friction in the bank if we've got more than this static friction. Uh, to figure out just where that limit is, where the minimum static friction is, we need to take the uh, normal force at the front wheel to be zero. A little bit more acceleration, a little bit more force at the back wheel with the, acceler the, with the, uh, the, the back wheel sticking, and that will start to pop up when we've got our wheeling. So we're going to assume that we're just at the point where anything more will cause the wheel to uh, pop up off the ground. Um, we don't want to go there yet because then we have to look at the angular acceleration of the bike as it, uh, as it does its wheel. All right, so there's our setup. Um, as for a kinetic diagram, what we expect that these two masses will not only accelerate, but they'll have the same acceleration. <coughs> it's, uh, it's been known for uh, bikes to accelerate a little more than the rider does, which is, uh, you can find some YouTube videos of that, I'm sure, where the bike goes down the road and the rider doesn't. That's not going to work for picking up babes. Got to stay on the bike, fellas. All right, so we need to find that acceleration as part of it. And not considering those as separate unknowns. The, the bike and the motorcycle will have the same acceleration. Okay, so there's our free body diagram. Uh, depending on how you yourself did it, if you did the kinetic diagram, it's pretty obvious in this case what we want to have happen. If we want to actually have the wheelie, then there would be a vertical component to the two of these, but we're just at the limit of doing that wheelie, so um, we're going to take those to be, uh, this just to be a translational problem. So, set up our equations of motion. We'll take in the direction of acceleration to be positive, just fewer minus signs that way. So we have uh, FB, the friction force, which is uh, mu S times uh, NB. Mu S we're looking for, uh, NB we don't happen to know yet. And that will cause the bike to accelerate, which is the uh, two masses, both 
at the acceleration that we're looking for. That looked like it in the x direction. In the y direction, we don't want any acceleration, so these should sum to zero. So we'll just take all the up forces, equal all the down forces, and as you might have expected then, and B equals W1 plus W2. Remember, we're taking NA to be zero. It's just as the front wheel starts to lift off of the uh, uh, lift off of the pavement. Sum the moments about which point. We can do it about any point we want, as long as we've got the, the uh, geometry for it. Now, we could, remember, combine these two centers of gravity to be just one for this rider and bike system, but that's extra complication. We gotta figure, it's going to be somewhere in between the two, but we'd have to figure out where, and we need to know the geometry of all that. Is there something that might be easier to do? Some of, the for, some of the forces about B, we've got two forces that go through that, and so they're not going to contribute to the moment equations. They become a little bit simpler. So, some of the moments about B, that then is IB alpha. Do we know anything about that? Don't say that that's equal to zero because we need to apply our parallel axis theorem. And it's the IG alpha we take to be zero. And then that MAG, well, uh, AG is the same for the both of them, and so the M just becomes the. Uh, uh, we, can, we can do those separately and just add them in. Um, in this case, my suggestion, though it's not crucial, you just have to be consistent, my suggestion is for this problem, because of the direction of the acceleration with respect to the point of interest, we'll take clockwise as the positive moment direction. Just makes for a few, few less uh, minus signs. All right, sum the moments. We have W2, which is 0.4 meters in front of point B. So we have 0.4 meters, W2. That's the rider. And that's a clockwise, so it's positive. Uh, W1 is 0.8 meters in front of the back wheel, the point B. So, 0.8 meters, W1. Remember, W1 and 2 are known. And we're assuming there, we're just at the point where there's no normal force at the front wheel. It's just ready to lift off. So that's all our moments. And now we can do MAGD for the two masses separately. So it'd be M1 AG. And what is D for M1? Do 
magnitude 0 0.1, it's got that kind of acceleration. What is the d we we uh, what is the d we put in there? 0.6 meters. It's the 0.6 meters. It's the minimum distance between the point minimum distance between the point and the line of action of the acceleration. which in this case is the 0.6 meters. And then we'll add on, just do M2 separately. They've got the same acceleration. What is D2? acceleration in the equation and it's at a distance of 0.9 above the uh, above the point B 0.3 meters and the 0.6 be careful don't go to the weight vectors the force vectors that represent weight themselves that's very easy to do as well what we're looking at is the acceleration vector that's sometimes uh, that's another reason that it's sometimes wise to do a kinematic diagram. The diagram that actually has the accelerations in it. So the masses are known. We've got two unknowns. I guess, let's see if we could, uh, NB, AG, uh, I guess, did we even need this third equation? No. Yeah, I don't think we did. But good, good practice to do it. I guess we didn't need it. It didn't give, give us anything. It would give us confirmation, I guess. Oh, well, uh, it's got AG in it all alone. So we either needed these two and didn't need the third, or we could have used the third all by itself. But they should confirm it. If those two don't agree, it's not too difficult to solve both of them. If those two don't agree, then you did something wrong, most likely a minus sign or something. So that should give you AG 895. Is that right? NB, which wasn't asked for, but we do need it to find the coefficient of friction, the minimum coefficient, and it looks like that's a 0.192, which is pretty high coefficient of friction. So if you're going to do this, boys, you might want to change where your center of gravity is. You think about whether you should lean forward or sit back more. Would it be easier if the tank was almost empty on the... They're, they're discussing this. You've got to think of all these things. But nobody said that attracting girls wasn't a hard job. That's why the men do it. <laughs> no, she wasn't listening. I don't think she listens to me anymore. I don't blame her. All right. I think you're ready for one. This one's um, got something you're going to have to pull all the way out of uh, statics. So, 50 kilogram crate being pushed on the ground. Good idea. No. Well, it never goes away. <laughs> no. It never gets old. No. No. Uh, 50 kilogram crate, and you want to find the acceleration without any tipping. So. The force.
force is 0.8 above the floor and parallel to it, and the crate is a meter on a side. And of zero thickness. So it's a 50 kilogram sheet of paper you're supposed to push across the floor. Classic two dimensional problem. All right. So I want you to draw the free body diagram and let's see. Who remembers a very obscure point from stacks? Which means the first time I went to it, I didn't remember it. That's my polite way of saying that. So, free body diagram. Of the crate. The weight acts right at the center. We'll assume it's a uniformly packed crate, whatever it might be. <coughs> so those two forces are the obvious ones. And we're looking to accelerate without tipping. So we want the acceleration to be horizontal. If it's going to tip, there'll be some vertical component to that. So let's see who remembers the very obscure point of, of this. Not tipping. here and we're looking for it to slide so the kinetic coefficient of friction is 0.2 and the force of friction will be right along that bottom surface of course parallel to and at the surface we wouldn't have that if there was no normal force, we'll call it NC so we don't confuse it with the N in Newtons, NC for the contact. Where is that? Remember all of these problems we're looking at, now that we're doing rigid body problems, we need to have not only the right magnitude and the right direction, but the right location of all forces. So if we don't put this uh, normal force, NC, the normal force between the crate and the floor, if we don't put it in the right place, we've got the wrong problem. David? How about at the front end of the block? Front end here? Yes. Uh, it would be there if it's at the point of tipping. If it was just ready to tip, then in exaggeration, it would be on that corner, and that's where the normal force would be. Until that point, and we may be at that point, we might not be, until that point, it's somewhere between there and where it would have been when the crate was just simply resting there. Once the force comes on the top here, P, that's, that force is tending to tip it clockwise. There must be some force that prevents it from tipping clockwise if we want to do this without tipping. Trouble is, we don't know what that is. I was wondering where it would be an unknown. Yeah, it's, it's not a big deal though, because that force has got to counterbalance the other direction tipping uh, tendency of the 600 Newton force. So it's, 
it's fairly easy to find out what it is. And as long as it's between 0 and 0 0.5, then we know that we're not going to be tipping. In fact, by doing this, we're assuming that we're not going to be tipping. Okay, so we can, uh, we can sum the forces. What do we have for unknowns? AG, X, well, this is NC, by the way. <coughs> AG is unknown, NC is unknown, uh, and X. So we have three unknowns. We have three unknowns. AG, which we're looking for, we want to find the acceleration without tipping. We don't know X, and we don't know NC. So we're going to need three equations. So might as well start with the X one. And that should be a great TV show, the X equation. All right, that's the acceleration we're looking for. Um, positive in the direction of the expected acceleration, P minus F. But F is mu K and C, so we'll make that substitution. Not consider F as a separate unknown, just keep things simple. Equals MH. And the mass is known, 50 kilograms, so that's no big deal. All right, you set up the other two equations. Got a couple minutes here. If you can get those equations, then it's just a matter of the algebra of solving for them. So you set up the other two necessary equations. We have two needed for three unknowns. We've only brought in two unknowns. If we can do without the third unknown, we're going to be okay. about which point. We can always do it about G. Uh, sometimes you don't know which one's easier until you've already gone through them, and it's certainly not easy to do the problem over again. In this case, we can say alpha equals zero. Some direction is positive. 
doesn't matter which. Actually, since they sum to zero, we can just do counterclockwise equals clockwise moments. So P times what as the moment arm for that force P? Point three because it's this distance here. So P times point three. P we know six hundred newtons times point three meters. That's a clockwise moment about the center of gravity G. W contributes nothing, it's through G. Uh, F is all, the friction force is also a uh, clockwise moment. So that's uh, 0.2 times NC 491. times its arm right there, the 0.5 meters. John, you're frowning. Um. So those are the two clockwise contributions of moment about G, and then NC is the only one left. It's a counterclockwise moment. And there's our X that uh, we, we need to find that because we need to check to make sure that it's between 0 and 0.5, which actually confirms that we're not tipping. Uh, so equals NC, which is 491X. And so you can get X right from that S. Four six seven meters, which uh, confirms that it's not tipping because that's less than the point five, so it's out there somewhere. We look, it can't go beyond the uh, edge of the box. So all those parts are left. Then you can find the acceleration to be ten meters per second. Which, if you notice is more than either the car or the motorcycle. So if you want to attract a girl, I guess uh, push a box in that parking lot and don't let it tip. It's my advice to you and I'm your advisor. Question. Watch out for that, uh, this business of IG alpha and IA alpha.